The Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude type. Could be sins of the tongue type. Could be overt sin type. They have to be confessed to move out of carnality and back into spirituality. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Verse 9 of 1 John 1 is connected with 1 John 1, 7 that says that cleansing comes from the blood of Christ extended to the Christian life, not for salvation, but for spirituality. It restores you to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? John 14, 26 the Holy Spirit will teach you and recall the doctrine in your soul, not only to you, but to others who are in need of it. <clears throat> so let's take a moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed to offer you privacy and to people around you. <clears throat> every time we take part in the Eucharist, we're told to examine ourselves. That's a constant for us. For spirituality, the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. None better in Bible study. And so, our Father, we thank you today for your love and mercy and grace upon our life. We thank you for the righteousness that has been accredited to us through the work on Christ, on the, of Christ on the cross when we believed. We've been accounted for righteousness' sake. It's a gift of grace, and we're so thankful for it, Father. We're thankful for it every day. We're thankful, Father, that we have a Galatians 2.20 in our life. Crucified with Christ is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that life of Christ that I live in me, I live by faith in the Son of God. Encourage our hearts, Father, in this great discussion that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 on spiritual gifted ministries. Never been anything like it, Father. You have, you have given us the Christmas gifts of all gifts in, the, in Christ. That baby born uh, in Bethlehem, reborn in our life in Alabama. Oh, Father, what an exciting time for the church to know they have spiritually gifted ministries that edify the church in the world. I pray, Father, today as we look at this, we've mentioned our prayer request, Father, earlier, and we lay them before you today, Father, out of the Hebrews 4.16 passage. What a privilege it is to come to the throne of grace in time of need. For we know you're a faithful God, and you will supply all that is necessary in the lives of the people we've prayed for. We are confident of that. We are assured of that. And we thank you for that. That confidence that comes from the study of the word of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we hear, here we are. We're in 1 Corinthians 13 going through chapters 12, 13, and 14. You really need to stay current with me. This is not one of those type of things you can drop in and be, you stay current. If you're not able to get to a Bible study, you pick it up before you get in here the next time off our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You need to stay current with me. Paul wrote chapters 12, 13, and 14 as a unit of thought. And we have discussed how Paul laid this out in the book. This is a a specific section, you recall, that started in chapter 7 and goes through chapter 15. This is a section of study. And uh, that's important that you know that. And we're in part of that study, chapters 12, 13, and 14. And we've gone through chapter 12. And now we're in chapter 13. Last week, we studied uh, uh, verses 13, chapter verses 1 through 3. Today, we go through the fourth verse through chapter 8, uh, through uh, verse 8, point A, love never fails. And this is an enormous, difficult passage. Everything Paul writes is difficult. If you think it's simple, you're not studying it. He is, a, he is a, listen, anytime you pick up, pick up an epistle of Paul, you need to read 2 Peter 3.16 before you begin studying it. 
And, you know, everybody's, oh, everything is about Paul. Everything is about Paul. And I agree. He wrote 13 of the New Testament books. I mean, there's a lot to be known about Paul, but he's a very difficult guy to understand. If you think I'm tough, pay attention to him because I don't give you all that he gives you. I give you as much as I think you can handle. He's a, he writes masterfully in the Greek language. He's a master of the Greek language. And when the Holy, he takes his learning ability and the Holy Spirit takes it and he writes phenomenal under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can't jump into any one of Paul's passages and take a verse out of context or you'll be dead in the water. I give you an example of that today. Now we talked, he introduced the entire chapter. He's talking about spiritual gifts and he writes a whole chapter on love. It's the greatest chapter on love, it's, but it's about spiritual gifts. He writes a great passage, but it's all connected with spiritually gifted ministries. He's talking to you. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has a spiritual gift. And he wants to tell you the importance of God's agape love in the function of your gift. In verses, in verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we're, and we, we, we stop after uh, love never fails. Notice, notice something. Notice at the end of verse 7, you have a period. He says, love never fails, and it's a semicolon. And it's not just a semicolon in the English, it's a semicolon in the Greek. And why he did that, you will learn today, that's a bridge idea. Love never fails is a bridge idea from verses 4 through 8. It's a bridge idea that takes you th through 8, 9, and 10. See, most people read love never fails as a period. But it's not a period. It's a semicolon. It's a pause. A pause to cause you to reflect on what's just been taught and what's about to come is you're going to need to know what I just said in order to go on with the discussion that I'm about to bring to you. You're going to need to know verses 1 through 7 to ever understand 8, 9, and 10. Okay? Which is the idea of some gifts are temporary. 8, 9, and 10. And so, here we are with Paul in verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and part of verse 8, 8 being that bridge idea. Today, we're going to take a look at six different ideas, but I want to introduce our passage. Paul explains different kind of effects. That God's agape love has in the function of, a spir of spiritual gifts. Now, I want you to get that. Because you're going to miss this. You're going to miss this. Four, five. See, see, look. Look over here. Verses four, five, six, and seven. Now, listen to me. It's one Greek word, one Greek sentence. It's one Greek sentence. It's, it's verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, but it's one Greek sentence. See, that's often missed in this. And it's very important that you know that. And what he's going to talk now is about how, the lo how love affects your spiritual gifts, ministry, the effect. The effect. See, when your spiritual gift functions under the Holy Spirit, it's like throwing a rock in a, into a lake and the ripples go out. One rock, a lot of ripples. See, you probably don't realize, but if you allow your gift to function under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there are effects that go out from the love aspect 
that you may never realize, but, the, but wherever the ministry is going is affecting them in so many different ways. How do I know that? Now, listen to me. Because of 1 Corinthians 12, 6. In the 12th chapter, 4, 5, and 6, Paul says that all members of the Godhead are involved in spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit's involved in your spiritual gift. The Lord Jesus Christ is involved in your spiritual gifts. And God the Father is involved in your spiritual gifts. Right? Do you know what the, God's job is? Look at the word effect. He affects the performance. When the gift is thrown out into the lake like a stone, the ripple effect that come out of it, the enormous effect that comes from it, that is designed by the plan of God to affect, God is in charge of. Now think about that. The performance effect, the ripples that go out from it that you're not even maybe aware of. It may be years. God may expose it later in life. Somebody goes like yada yada. You go like no kidding. <laughs> I, I had no idea that rippling effect that goes out. And he says, the thing that the thing that you want to do is be sure that love is operating your gift. So that love takes that effect. Those effects that go out from your gift are done by the love of God. The love of God. The love of God. The love of, see, that's Paul's point in chapter 13. He talks about spiritual gifts in 12, stops to do 13 on love, and then comes back to spiritual gifts in chapter 14. Uh, it's just, it's... So here we are. He talks about love. Now, you really got to pay attention to what he's going to do. And, and I'm going to pay as much attention to it as I can with you to help you get through here because what Paul wants you to know is God's love never what? Never fails. You think yours does? Probably on a daily basis, right? Squeeze my head in my world, and I get upset. You can stop. Listen, when, when you, when anything that pushes you into the flesh stops the, stops the love flow. Because uh, I'm not talking about human love. I'm talking about divine love. Stops it. So, this lesson will study six aspects of why, look at your paper, why God's agape love never fails to have an effect when, the, when your spiritual gifted ministry is exercised. Your gift is like dropping the, the stone in their lake and the effect that comes out of it. If it's done in love, the effect that comes out of your gift working, what God wants is it for, for it to work in the principle of God's love. He wants the effect to have the God's love effect on it. See, for a guy like me, you got to be careful, Ron, that it's not just all technical. When you drop that, when you drop that, that gift of yours in the water, be sure that where the rippling effect of the teaching goes, that it goes with the love of God. You understand that? That's what Paul's talking about. So in verses 4 through 7, this is his idea. Point number one. It's important to understand how Paul lays out Verses 4 through 8a. It's important to understand the Greek grammar here. Paul writes masterfully out of the Greek language. 
You don't often see it in the Greek, in the English. Now, the English translations are, are done really well. When you become a student of the languages, you'll find that the English translations, for the most part, are really good to the languages. But when you study a passage like this, you got one sentence. It's important for you to know that. And the way he lays the grammar out is important for you to understand. This is an important subject to him. He devoted a whole chapter on love. Love with spiritual gifts. And so it's important you know that because when we get to the 13th chapter, verse 8, we follow a period with love never fails with a semicolon. That's, in the Greek language, that's a way you bridge one idea to another one. Because a semicolon requires you to pause, reflect on what he's just said, because it's going to be important to know what he's about to say. I don't, I, I, I can't explain it better than that. If you need it better than that, why... Go to the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the best I can do with it. It's a bridge idea. Verses 4 through 7, bridged idea, God's love never fails, to take you to verses 8, 9, and 10, where some gifts are going to be temporary. Some are going to be done away with, and some are going to cease. And you better pay attention to what I, he said, you better pay attention to what I just told you, because this will probably rock your world a little bit. I know when I teach it, it rocks people's world. And Paul has prepared us for that. So that's, that's the first idea that's for, important for you to get to look at this. The second idea is also important to understand how Paul used, listen to me, 16, there in, in, from one sentence, in the Greek language, including the word fail, love never fails. One Greek sentence, in one Greek sentence, there are 15 main verbs. And the 16th one is added with the bridge idea, never fails. Think about that. Think about writing one sentence that with 16 main verbs. That's a whole lot of information. You're trying to jam a lot of information in there. Main verbs are the engine of a car. A main verb is the engine of a car. He didn't give you one engine. He put 16. <laughs> in verse, verses 4 through 7, there are 15 main verbs. The 16th is picked up in the word, love never fails. I can't begin to impress you how unbelievable it is to have 15 main verbs in one Greek sentence. I mean, you talk about overload. Now, the only people who would even care about that and their eyes would roll back in their head is the guy who has to exegete it and look up every one of those 15 and 16th verbs. And then he looks back and he says, but I, I only had one Greek sentence. And let me tell you, when you look up every one of those verbs to get it correct, you're talking a little bit of work. See, you read the English, you don't pay attention that that's a present active indicative. You don't pay any attention to that. But the Greek student does because every one of these 16 main verbs are present indicatives. You go, oh, in the Greek language, you never find anything like that. You'll have a main verb and it'll be participles and infinitives and God knows what. You're lucky to find a main verb. You're always hunting for one. Here there are 16. I'm trying to impress you how important this is. 
That's what I'm trying to impress you with in one Greek sentence. There are 15 main verbs, and they're all present indicatives. The 16th was love never fails, pipto. I, 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 I don't know how to impress you any more than that. This is out of sight. Therefore, all of these main verbs, they're connected in a specific way in one verse to teach you something about God's love. And the main idea is that it, God's love never fails. That's the main idea. That's the reason I titled it this way. But he's going to talk so much more about it. He's going to talk so much more about it. Watch very carefully. Here's one thing you'll miss. Watch very carefully. Watch very carefully. Verse 4. Watch this very carefully. Love is patient. Love is kind. That's two of three virtues. Now watch what he did. He went into knots. Count them. Count the knots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? Count them. Did you count them? Now watch. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Then he goes in, a, then he stops, right? He breaks. Those are positives. Come on now. Love is, love is patient, love is kind. Those are positives. Then he stops, and he gives eight negatives. Agreed? Do you see that? Right in a row. Chaboom, chaboom. And all of those are present indicatives. They all, all, every verb in there is a present indicative. Are you with me? But see, he gave you two positive and he stopped. And then he told you what love is not. Right? He breaks. He, he, he gives you two positives. <laughs> and then he broke. He broke from the positive. Did he not break from positives? Come on now. And he went into a, ser eight, a series of ooks. The word not is ook. That's a strong negative. He d and then he, he, he does it. Now watch. Watch this. Let, let's go down there. Is not jealous. Love is kind. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a, a, a wrong suffered. does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Agreed? You got eight of them? And they're in a series, aren't they? They're all negatives. Then he breaks again. Goes through eight negatives, and then he breaks again. And he gives you a positive. Those are three virtues. Love is patient. Love is kind. Then he gives you eight negatives. And he comes back and gives you the third virtue. And off from, off from the three virtues of love, he's going to give you four things that are stretched out from them. Watch this now. Do you see the four tailing? One more time. I know. Look, I know. I know. Verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Now, look, watch this now. Look verse 7. Watch verse 7. Look at the word all things. How many are there? Well, let's count them. All th bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Right? See the all things? How many is that? Four. Four. And you know what these four all things work off from? The three virtues. The three great positives that lead to positives. 
all. You can apply patience, you can uh, apply kind, and you can apply rejoice to all of those four. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know why? Here's a bridge idea. God's love never fails. Yours will, but not his. And yours will not fail under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but it will fail in the flesh. Agreed? Well, you'll know it by the end of the day, by the end of the study. You know why you come to this church? To listen to this kind of teaching. You know why other people don't come to this church? Because they don't want to listen to that kind of teaching. Because they don't really want to know what the Bible really says. I just told you what the Bible really says by the way Paul laid it out in the Greek language. And so I'm appreciative of you that come. I'm appreciative of you who come by the Internet and listen with us and stay current with me on this because you're not going to be able to jump into any of these messages, any of these passages out of context. You're dead in the water if you try to do this out of context. Everything is linked together by Paul in this study on spiritual gifts. What Paul just did is phenomenal. And you know how I discovered all this? I studied the languages. I'm driven by the languages for my people. I'm not asking you to study in them. I'm asking you and I thank you to pay my way so that I can study all the time to bring this kind of information to you. You don't get this information quickly. You have to dig it out. And so I thank you for it. There are a lot of hours. And you give it to me for me to bring it to you in the reality of your time. And I'm thankful for that. I can tell you, I am really thankful for, for, for that. Here's point number three. Now, remember how this thing, watch, watch how this all, the series, he starts out with two positive, then goes into a series of negatives, right? He breaks, goes through negatives and breaks again, brings a third virtue of love out, and then connects the three virtues to the last four things of all things. And then he says, because love never fails. God's love never. And when I get to the never, you, I'm going to blow your socks off. Because never, never, there's no English idea like the Greek never that Paul used. Ude pote. It's even fun to say, isn't it? Ude pote. I mean, who, who doesn't love to say that? It sounds like an Indian or something. Ude pote. Hey, mama, who you? Right? Here's point number three. Got to pay attention now. Second, Second Peter 3.16, you got to put on your thinking hat, cap. When Paul returned after the series of eight negatives, not ook not, he added a third virtue of God's agape love called rejoice. Now pay attention to this word, rejoice. In this passage, the key word is Cairo, Cairo, but he put the preposition soon on the front of it, which means together. It means rejoice together. Together with what? And he tells you what? To rejoice, to rejoice together with the what? With the people? With your meal? What did he tell you? Rejoice what? With what? With the truth. Aletheia. Definite article with Aletheia, meaning the truth of the word of God. <laughs> I will tell you again, because you missed it. You are to rejoice together with what? The truth. Not rejoicing together with a bunch of people who came. That's a whole nother deal. That is true. But that's a whole nother thing. That's not what he said. 
He said to rejoice with the truth. Rejoice with the truth. You know why you come to Bible study? To hear the truth of the word of God? You, come, you know why? Because it brings joy to know the truth from the word of God. Why? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You'll know the truth and truth will set you free. John 8, 32. And when that clicks inside your soul, you're going to be hungry for the truth. Listen, just like a runner who runs for endorphins, right? You start out for health, and then you get addicted. I did. I ran to get that. I ran till my tongue hung out just to get that taste of an endorphin. I had to quit because I realized that I had to come back to a sensible run for health. Study the word of God for truth, and the truth brings joy to your soul because it sets you free from lies and cosmic system of foolish believing, right? We've been studying that on, on Wednesday. Come for lunch with us, 1130, 1230, and do Bible study and have a great lunch. The, the ladies are doing a phenomenal job for lunch, 1130, 1230. We don't even ask you to leave a tip. We, we even cover the tip. Now, how good is that? We don't even have a jar that says, on your way out, pay for something. We, we go grace all the way. <laughs> so come and eat with us. We've been studying uh, 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 another subject over there. Pay attention. When Paul returns to the series, he adds a third virtue. So what's my third virtue? Uh, what's my first one? Come on, people. I'm going to give you a break in a minute. Give, give me a little time. I'll give you coffee and donuts. You, it won't be a jar for you to put money in either. You, uh, recently, I've just gone through that. This is on grace, but here's a jar. <laughs> and uh, I don't care. We're not going to put a jar out either. What are my three virtues? What's my first one? What's my second one? Kind. What's my third one? Rejoice. Rejoice. That's my third. That's three virtues here. And they carry the whole ballgame. And when you, put, when you put the three positives, patience, kindness, rejoicing, then it, this, the, these three virtues, they bear all things, believe all things, they endure all things, Hope all things, yeah, right? I don't know. I, I can only teach it. I can't make you believe it. All I can do is teach it. That's my job. Rejoice with the truth. Rejoice with the truth. So you really got to be able to see that. See, that's when your gift goes, throw, you throw your gift out, it hits the lake, and the ripples go out. That's your gift working. But here's what love does. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love rejoices with the truth. And it has this uh, rippling effect so that people can bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. <sighs> That's the ripple effect. Be sure that when your gift goes out, it goes out with that love. And be sure that you know the rippling effect, the awesome effect that God is going to have upon that gift working way beyond what you can think or imagine. Isn't that wonderful? Because God's in charge. And he takes that thing, he takes that gift movement, and he pushes that thing out so that the virtue, the virtue of patience, the virtue of kindness, the virtue of rejoicing, where people are going to be able to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, all that is being, and, and more is all being out there. Now, aren't you glad you came today? Aren't you glad you came today? What do these three virtues of God's agape love have in common? Here, why have your teacher? You know what they have in common? Now, do not miss this. We're going to take a break. 
Do not miss this. What do they all have in common? Listen. The three virtues. They are fruit of the indwelling Holy Spirit recorded in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. When you read that, here's, here's the beginning list. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is patience. And it is kindness. One, two, three, four, five. The first five, four of them are in our passage. He's talking about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. There's two of them. The word joy is the root word for Cairo. Listen to me. Joy is where rejoicing comes from. Cairo comes from Kara, joy, rejoicing. <laughs> so what do we learn? We learn how important walking in the Spirit is in the function of your spiritual gift. Where he can produce love that has an effect on, on the other fruit connection. How they intertwine and work. Verse 5, the only one he didn't mention was peace. And listen, when you got all of this working like that, in this rippling effect, listen, God's going to take it all the way out to the end of it. it was so that it will bear all things, and believe all things, and hope all things, and endure all things. How about that? How about that, people? Isn't that interesting? So you're told to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. In, in Galatians 5.16, you said, say, walk in the spirit. Well, that's a choice. It's a mental choice you make to walk in the spirit. Listen, you should walk in the spirit every moment of your life. And you need to walk so much in it that it becomes habitual. Listen, you don't think to yourself, I'm going to walk in the flesh. Something happens here in the flesh, right? Don't raise your voice to me. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Flesh? Spirit wouldn't have responded that way. You didn't even stop and think, well, what am I going to do? Boom, boom. That's habitual. You've got to learn to walk in the Spirit so the fruit of the Spirit becomes habitual in your life so that you don't have to stop and think, I need to be spiritual. It's a norm and standard of your life. That's why walk is in the present tense. It's a constant. You've got to, you've got to work, quote, you've got to work on it from the mental side until it becomes habitual. Right? It's, it's called exercise. You do understand that, don't you? Exercise. Well, this explains the importance of walking by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the exercise of your spiritually gifted ministry. It's just, it's just Paul's phenomenal way of teaching, just his phenomenal way of teaching. And, uh, you know, in the law of hermeneutics, your first responsibility is to show the people what the writer said. And then try to take that into context properly into their life in the church. And so that's what we're trying to do. Notice that what preceded rejoices in the, uh, with the truth. Uh, what preceded was the last negative, which I just described, which was a bridge to the third virtue. Do you see what he did? It was... A, not to rejoice in unrighteousness, but to rejoice uh, with the truth. See what he did? He bridged it. <laughs> uh, 
I know you can see that. He, he bridged it. He's going to come back, and he, when he says love never fails, he's going to use it a bridge idea. He's going to use it in a final bridge idea. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. He introduces that third. Note that 3.6, in 3.6. It does not end. It doesn't, it, it doesn't end with a semicolon. Um, it doesn't end with anything. I tell you the truth, I didn't bring my Greek grammar with me. Well, wait. Let me check that just a moment. I think I did bring it. 13.6. Let me just check that for make sure. There's not rejoice, but. No, it's just a comma. Anybody brought your Greek grammar? It, it, is it a semicolon? Okay. Okay. Well, I didn't. I didn't catch that thing. Uh, I identified that. I identified when I wrote this down. I identified it ends with a semicolon, not a period. A semicolon was a way to pause. Was a way to pause in order to include the three virtues. I think you can see he does it. Does it with a bridge sentence anyhow, even if it. Even if you didn't go to a semicolon, if there's a semicolon there, and I, and I, I, I believe there is, but I, I, I'm not confident. But it doesn't matter. It is a bridge sentence. But if there's a semicolon, it sure is, because semicolon causes you to reflect, to stop. He he stopped with the negatives. He closed with a negative to bridge into the positive, the third positive. I mean, do it again. Uh, after truth. I got you. I got you. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Now what, what he's done, he's established the three key virtues. Patience, kindness, and rejoicing. Remember, rejoicing comes off from the word kara, uh, the word joy, as a fruit of the Spirit. What he's doing is, once again, he's trying to show us, he's setting it up to identify the three virtues on which the, he can put now lay out the next four things, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. See, the key word is all things. That he doesn't do that without purpose. And, and is there with all of them. It, it's all there with all of them. It's, a, it's pas used uh, as a neuter. It's just the way... Paul writes, and he writes in a phenomenal way. And then, love never fails with a semicolon, and that's important to next week's idea. That's really important to next, next week. Uh, point number five. The point of Paul's concluding doctrinal point with the idea God's love never fails is the word never. Ude pote. That's a compound that's a compound, ude pote. These are two separate ideas. And it's what in the Greek language they call an intensive negative temporal adverb. And here's what that it means. Never, 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 never. And somebody goes, well, what about I said never? And somebody, somebody else in the back will go like, well, what about I said never? Well, what about Never. Ude Pote says, I don't care what you bring up, never. <laughs> Ude Pote. You might say that to your children sometime. Ude Pote. It's never going to happen, ever, would be another way. It's never going to happen, never. I don't know. I don't know if we'd have the courage to do that. Would you have the courage to do that? God's love never, 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 ever, never, ever, 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 never, ever, never. 
fail. And that's a present active indicative third person singular. Remember, that, that is the 16th present indicative in a series. 15 of them in one Greek sentence. And then the bridge idea. The doctrinal point or principle for me is God's agape love never fails when spiritual gifts function under the indwelling Holy Spirit. What am I going to walk away with that? There's a doctrinal principle I can walk away with. When, when, you drop, when your spiritual gift drops in that lake the, and, it, and you're under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the effect of love, the effect of love by walking in spirit, you have love. You have all of this, don't you? You have love. Remember the first five? The only one that's not mentioned is peace. They're all there. The rippling effect that comes out of that, the effect of your gift working, is way beyond anything you could possibly imagine. The, the love, the kindness, the patience. And, and he just mentioned three of the fruit of the Spirit. Just, you know why? Because in 1 Corinthians 6, not as 12, 6, it says God's in charge of the effects according to the plan of God. Look, when your gift functions, let, let's say you have the gift of mercy and somebody is in a difficult way in their life and you know it. I mean, they're, they're into some type of suffering or whatever. And you exercise that gift. You don't know all the ramifications of their life or in their family's life or maybe in their extended family's life, or how deep, or maybe into the doctoring staff that works with them, or the nursing staff that works with them. You have no idea the layers of people that are involved in the person that you realize is suffering. Are you with me? There could be a vast amount of people connected to that that you're not even aware of. Agreed? Just staff people. Uh, caregivers and all of that. Listen to me. What he's saying is that when you let your gift minister to that suffering, you let mercy suffer to deal with that. Listen, the rippling effect that comes out of that under the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, God takes that and he pushes that as far as it needs to go to touch the lives just like your life touched the life of that suffering one, it goes out and touches the life of all of those who are dealing with the suffering of the suffering one that your life touched. That's because God is God. You have no idea the effect. Let's say you're a medical person, and that person comes to you. You know they're suffering. And let's say you don't have the gift of mercy. You have the position of dealing with mercy, right? You may not have the gift, but you have the opportunity. And so you minister that person. You minister that person out of your growth and your care and the reason you're into medicine. Why you chose it above other things you could have chosen. You chose it. And, and you, love every, you love your work that the Lord has singled in your life. You love it every morning. You get up excited about going and touching people's life in a place that they have need. Right? If you do that in love, if you not just minister to them. You know, when, when Jane and I go to the hospital... I'm amazed the difference between somebody who has a career in medicine and somebody who has a ministry in it. There's a stark difference. And it don't take you long with them to know the difference. Those people that have been called into medicine, what they do to patients is way beyond treatment way beyond it. And it was interesting to watch my wife respond 
to ministry of medicine other than just people who were in medicine. I mean, it fired her spiritually up. It's a phenomenal thing, that ripping effect. And you have no idea how far it goes from the point that you're engaged in somebody, how far out that goes in your profession, in your clinic, in your hospital, in that family, in the family of friends, the people who are praying. The rippling effect that it has. God is a marvelous God. And when we exercise things His way and His timing, the effect goes so far beyond what you and I could imagine. And this is what Paul is trying to remind us. You don't always have to see it to know what's going on. And so Paul kind of, for me, it's like throwing a, 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 a rock or a, a, a block <laughs> into the water. You know, the bigger the bigger thing, the bigger the splash, right? When your gift, for, gift and love is a, is a big block thrown in there and the rippling effect. It's large at the beginning, but it's still out there, isn't it? It goes way out, way out to the places that you wouldn't think it would go. And this is what Paul is trying to encourage us about. God's love never fails. It never fails. God's agape love never fails when the spiritual gift functions under the indwelling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And then when that's done, then God grabs that. As soon as that gift works under the Spirit, then God grabs that thing and pushes it all the far, as far as he can push it. Now, if you pay any attention, when Rick Rodkins comes home and gives you a report, then he comes back and gives you a review, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the rippling effect. When Jackie comes in off a foreign mission field, foreign culture, foreign place, foreign people, foreign languages, and comes back, she's going to talk about her ministry and the rippling effect. And it goes on and on. You call these people back, Rick, Rick and Jackie, another year from now, the rippling effect is still going on. And it's not so much what you've done, it's what God has taken with what you've done in the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit by the Word of God. It's what He's able to do in His plan, which is so bigger than what we're doing. The plan of God is so much bigger than what we're doing. God takes that and runs that. See, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 12, 6, and takes and runs that according to the plan of God and milks it, milks it all the way out until there's just a very, a very teeny bit of rippling. It's still going out, but it's going out so far out there that if you knew it, you'd be amazed. This is what Paul's talking about. This is exactly what Paul, and out of great ministry, what you think is a little bit, a little bit of ministry here, boom, God takes that thing and goes, out it goes. You've got to have the confidence to know that. Listen to me, what he said. When that goes out, watch this. When that goes out, it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. It's true with your gift. I don't care what your gift is. It could be the gift of helps. doesn't have to be the gift of evangelism or teacher. doesn't have to be like that. The gift of helps, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving. <laughs> See? And everybody has a gift, and everybody has a a gift that has the potential to do something. Look, you can go to work and, and, and live your life. Galatians 5.20. I am, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life, you right? And when you do that, you know what happens? This rippling effect. In the place where you work. The people who you work with. They leave there, and they go to people that you don't know. (laughs) 
I know you know that. You may not just realize how important it is when the Spirit of God says, say a word, give a word of encouragement, stop and have prayer with that person. Be bold. Step out of your, out of your place of uncomfort because when, when you have a place of comfort, it's uncomfort, truly. You have to always be ready to step out and do what God is doing. I go to a doctor. The doctor says to me, I have no idea why you're here, Ron. You're as healthy as anybody I've seen. I said, well, another doctor sent me. He said, I ought to come and check you. He said, well, let me check. He checked me all out, and he went like, well, I have no idea why you're here, Ron. Listen, I said, well, then I do. If, if I'm not here for you, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not here for me, then I'm here for you. So I looked in the doctor and I said to him, there's something either going on in your personal life or your professional life that we need to talk about. It will be t totally in confidence, but you need to come clean with me because I'm not here. If I'm not here for health, I'm here for ministry. He stepped back a moment, folded his arms and looked at me. I said, yeah, I'm the real deal. I know I'm not here. If I'm not here for medicine, I'm here for ministry. Now, it may be hard for you to understand this because you're a medical guy and I'm, quote, the patient, but I'm no longer a patient. Would you agree? I'm not a patient. Yeah, then let's quit that stuff because you're still a doctor and I'm not a patient. So I'm the minister. And we got something to get done here today. And he says to me, just wait a minute. And he goes out of the room and he comes back with his head nurse. And we have ministry. Had problems within the staff in his heart unit. He's got a problem with staff. Inner fighting. Bad for patients. Don't know what to do. There was a chalkboard on the little room where they eat, where they she took me. And they had the word problem written on it, nothing else. And so whenever a Christian went in the room, they were to pray because they had a problem. It wasn't a dread. Listen, you do know that if your prayer is going to be answered, you have to pray according to the will of God. I said to her, you know why nothing's happening? You don't get anything done by saying problem on a board and pray, we got a problem. What's the answer? So we started writing writing scriptures on the word. I said, you got to write them out when people come in. It's not about the problem. It's about the solution. Oh, they, you say, you sit there and you say, well, that's easy for you, Ron. You're a preacher. I couldn't do that. I didn't do that because I was a preacher. Listen, it was, much, it, was much, it was much difficult for me to step out and to say to him, if I'm not here for medicine, I'm here for ministry. But I know in my heart that was true. I knew in my heart that was true. And I have to be true to what I know in my heart. God didn't send me. If he didn't send me for... Listen, I'd been all right with medicine. If, but there was no medicine to be done. Then for it was ministry to me. And you know what I know when I walk away? And I went back and I kept, a, I've, I've kept in touch with this lady. And I give her, she calls me, what Bible verse can I have for yada, yada? And I tell her, and I tell her, make sure they understand that you're not going to get your prayers without, according to his will, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. You know why I do that? I don't do that because I'm a preacher. I do that because I'm a believer in Christ. I'm always looking. I'm always on the look. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm always looking for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Lord. I'm always trying to hurt, help hurting people. I'm always on the lookout. 
And sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone to meet a need. Doing anything because, well, Ron, you're in a ministry. We're all in a ministry. We're all in a ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just me. It is interesting to me when I read chapter 13, there's no imperative. I had 16 verbs, and I had 15 verbs in one sentence and one carryover. Not one imperative. In fact, I don't have one in the whole 13th chapter. Not one command. I find that interesting. That's unusual for Paul. That's really unusual. Not one command. He's coaxing us to engage in ministry. Not commanding us. He's encouraging us based on love. Ministry because you have love. I knew somebody in there, in that office, needed to be approached with the love of God. You know how I learned it? The Word of God. I didn't learn it because I'm in the ministry. I didn't learn it because I went to seminary. I didn't learn it because I had I Listen, I learned it because I walk in the power of the Spirit. It's in a recipe. There's no command. God's love never fails. It's a wonderful grace promise to each spiritually gifted believer. Never fails. When people come to me, they have marital problems. I take them to this verse. Because they're always talking about, well, we've fallen out of love. You can't fall out of it. You got the wrong word, I say. I say, you have the wrong word. I like it begins with an F. Well, we're going to change, the, we're going to change it scripturally because you just said an unscriptural truth. And I take him to 13.8. Love never fails, not falls, fails. What are you going to do with that? Well, I don't know. Well, don't you think you ought to know before you throw your marriage under the bus? That you're talking, you're talking and going to make a decision that's unscriptural and you're a believer? Don't you think you ought to look at that seriously? <laughs> Love never fails. If it's failing, you're not understanding what your responsibility is. You walk in the Spirit, and you have what? What's the first fruit? What's the very first fruit you get supernaturally charged off into your life? Love. God's love never fails. Human love will never succeed. God's, God's love never fails. It's a wonderful promise given to each of us. It is based on the, on the positives of the character of God. Three virtues and four all things. What a wonderful idea. Well, I've given you other things to study, and I'm out of time. It would be well worth your read, in my opinion, to do point six. Because God's love, listen to me, I'm going to close. I'm going to let you go. God's love, get this one, point six is a big one, is a covenant love. God's love is covenant love. It's based on your relationship with God through redemption in Christ. Agape love is a covenant relationship. That's why it never fails. That's why God's love never fails. It's a covenant relationship based on redemption in Jesus Christ. You're, that no man can come to the Father except through me. When you go to him, you got the Father. And you got him forever. Whether you like it or not, you got him forever. And you need to read this. It was true in the Old Covenant. It's, true in the tr new, it's new in the New Covenant. God's love is a covenant relationship, and we need to enter it in a covenant relationship ID, idea. And when you connect with other people, you've got to understand it's a covenant relationship with other people. 
You got to really understand that. Well, I got to go home and eat. I got the tribe coming over today. So I got to go home and eat. That, you, did you smell that food cooking downstairs? Yeah. To remind you to come on Wednesday. <laughs> we, we, we have a new scent in the church on Sunday. It's food cooking to remind you to come on Wednesday. Let us serve you lunch. Father, we're so thankful for all of your love and mercy and grace. We're thankful for these who have come our way to study with us today. Father, I'm so thankful for each person. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of their life, that they might see the rippling effect, at least see it spiritually, even if they may never see the impact of it, of the rippling effect. May they see it spiritually and know that God will continue that because God's love never fails. And it has such a, a rippling effect so far out beyond what we were doing because God is in charge of a magnificent plan that we're a part of. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.